Hello and welcome to the Daily News Simplified, the why, what and how of newspaper reading. Today we will discuss the daily edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 26th May 2018. So let's start. There is an article on page number 5 which reads, Crocodile released into Chambal after village stint. This article is in news because forest officials have released a crocodile into the Chambal river which had strayed into a village near the river. Now, without getting into the details of this article, we will learn about certain facts related to crocodiles from the prelims point of view. Now, under the preliminary examination, this topic will fall under the topic biodiversity. Previously, in the year 2017, two questions were asked on the crocodiles. So, after learning some facts related to crocodiles, we will try to answer these questions. There are three types of crocodiles found in India. They are the Magar crocodile, the Ghadiyal and the saltwater crocodile. We will learn about certain facts related to all the three types of crocodiles from prelims point of view. So let us start with the Magar crocodile. The Magar crocodile is a freshwater species. That is, it is found in lakes, rivers and marshes. It is not found in the coastal areas. They are also known to thrive in man-made reservoirs and irrigation canals. This crocodile is the most common and widespread of all the three species of crocodiles in India. In 1980s, the largest population of wild crocodiles was found in Amravati Reservoir and in the Chinar, Thenar and Pambar River that drain into this reservoir. Now, Amravati Reservoir has been created on the Amravati River, which is a tributary of Kaveri River. And finally, the Amravati Sagar Crocodile Farm that was established in 1975 is the largest crocodile nursery in India. So, all these points are important from Prelims point of view. These points are... The Magar crocodiles are freshwater species. They can also thrive in man-made reservoirs and irrigation canals. This is the most common and widespread of all the three species of crocodiles in India. Largest population is found in the Amravati reservoir, which is built on Amravati river. And Amravati river is the tributary of Kaveri river. And finally, the Amravati Sagar crocodile farm, which was established in 1975, is the largest crocodile nursery in India. Now let us have a look at the conservation status of the Magar crocodile. The Magar crocodile is listed as vulnerable on the IUCN's red list. Further, it is protected under the Schedule 1 of Wildlife Protection Act 1972. Now let us have a look at some of the important facts related to the Ghadiyals. The Ghadiyals, which are also known as the Gavial or the fish-eating crocodile. It is native to the northern part of the Indian subcontinent. In India, small populations are present and increasing in the rivers of the National Chambal Sanctuary. It is also found in Katharni Ghat Wildlife Sanctuary, which is located in the Upper Gangetic Plains in Uttar Pradesh. It is also found in the Son River Sanctuary. Son is a tributary of the river Ganga. A small amount of population is found in the Mahanadi River in the Odisha, in the Satkoshia God Sanctuary. In 2008, a population of about 100 Ghadiyals was recorded in the Corvette Tiger Reserve as well. And in 2010, Several Ghadiyals were recorded in the Gandaki River near Valmiki Tiger Reserve which is located at the India-Nepal border in the West Champaran district of Bihar. So the important points are that it is native to the northern part of India. It is found in the Chambal Sanctuary, the Katharni Ghat Sanctuary, Son River, Mahanadi River, in the Corbett Tiger Reserve and in the Gandaki River near Valmiki Tiger Reserve. The Ghadiyal is listed on the sites in the Appendix 1. CITES is the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora. The Ghadiyal is also protected under the Schedule 1 of the Wildlife Protection Act 1972. It is listed as critically endangered by the IUCN in its red list. So we have learned about the locations where the Ghadiyals are found and the conservation status of the Ghadiyal. And finally let us have a look at some of the important facts related to the saltwater crocodile. The saltwater crocodile is also known as the Ashurine crocodile. It is the largest of all the living reptiles. This crocodile can live in marine environments, but it usually resides in saline, brackish mangrove swamps, estuaries, deltas, lagoons and lower stretches of the rivers. It is mostly found on the eastern coast of India and is extremely rare on the Indian subcontinent. It is found in large numbers in the Bhitar Kanika Wildlife Sanctuary of Odisha. It is also found in the mangrove forests and other coastal areas of Andaman and Nicobar Islands in India. So the key points that should be learned are that it is also known as the Estuarine Crocodile. It is the largest of all the living reptiles. It is found in brackish mangrove swamps, estuaries, deltas, lagoons and lower stretches of rivers. 
It is found on the eastern coast of India and is rarely found in the other parts of country. Large number of population is found in Bitar Kanika Wildlife Sanctuary of Odisha. It is also found in the mangrove forests and other coastal areas of Andaman Nicobar Islands in India. And for conservation, it is listed in the Sites in Appendix 1. Sites is a convention which prohibits commercial trade in species or its byproducts. So till now we have learned that there are three types of crocodiles that are found in India. They are the Magar crocodiles, the Ghadiyals and the saltwater crocodiles. We have also learned that Magar crocodile and the Ghadiyals are freshwater crocodiles while the saltwater crocodile lives in brackish areas. We learned about the important locations where the Ghadiyals, the Magars and the saltwater crocodiles are found and we also looked at the conservation status of all the three types of crocodiles that are found in India. Now let us try to answer the questions that were asked in the preliminary examination in the year 2017. Now the first question reads, if you want to see ghadiyals in their natural habitat, which one of the following is the best place to visit? The first option is Bitar Kanika mangroves, second is Chambal river, third is the Pulikat lake and D is the Deepor bill. The first option is incorrect because in Bitar Kanika mangroves, salt water crocodiles are found. And the correct answer is the Chambal River, where we learned that Ghadiyals are found. And the second question reads, according to Wildlife Protection Act 1972, which of the animals cannot be hunted by any person except under provisions provided by law? So we have learned that Ghadiyal is protected under the Wildlife Protection Act. The Indian wild ass and the wild buffalo are also protected in the Wildlife Protection Act 1972. So the correct answer is D. 1, 2 and 3. With this, let us move on to the next article. There is an article on page number 11 which reads Forex reserves fell $11 billion in a month, RBI. Forex here means foreign exchange. So this topic is related to economy and will fall under the General Studies Paper 3 and is an important part of the preliminary syllabus. Previously, questions have been asked based on foreign exchange reserves in the year 2013 and in the year 2016, a question was asked on the composition of IMF's SDR, that is Special Drawing Rights. Now the article says that RBI is intervening in the foreign exchange market to prevent rupee depreciation. This intervention is leading to a fall in India's foreign exchange reserves. So under this article we will understand why is the rupee depreciating, how RBI intervenes in the foreign exchange market and what are foreign exchange reserves. And after going through the details we will try to answer the questions asked in the previous year examinations. Now the focus of the article is that RBI is intervening in the foreign exchange market to prevent rupee depreciation. And the consequence of this intervention is that it is leading to a decline in India's foreign exchange reserves. Now the background is that oil prices are increasing and this is leading to rupee depreciation. And we know that the depreciation of rupee poses a threat to India's macroeconomic stability. This is because India imports 80% of its crude oil requirements. So the RBI is intervening in forex market to prevent the rupee depreciation. This is leading to a decline in the foreign exchange reserves. And we know that oil prices are increasing which is leading to the rupee depreciation. And it is posing a threat to the macroeconomic stability and which is because India imports 80% of its oil requirements. Now the rupee depreciation here means that in the foreign exchange market the demand of rupee is decreasing. This is because there is an excessive supply of rupee in the foreign exchange market. And we know that RBI is responsible for managing the exchange rate of rupee. Now how RBI manages the exchange rate? So to prevent the rupee from depreciating, RBI increases the sale of its foreign exchange reserves. Now for example, RBI has enough dollar reserves. Now to check the depreciation of rupee, RBI starts selling these dollars for rupees. Due to this, a decrease in the amount of rupee in the foreign exchange takes place. Now due to this decrease in the amount of rupee in the foreign exchange market, the demand for rupee increases. And this leads to the appreciation of rupee. However, as a result of this intervention in the foreign exchange market, the foreign exchange reserves of India have declined by $11 billion. So we have learned that rupee depreciation means in foreign exchange market, the demand for rupee is decreasing. This is because there is increasing supply of rupee in the foreign exchange market. And we know that RBI is responsible for managing the exchange rate of rupee. Now how RBI does this? RBI increases the sale of its foreign exchange reserve. For example, it sells dollars and it leads to a decrease in the amount of rupee in the foreign exchange market. Due to this, the demand of rupee increases, which in turn leads to the appreciation of rupee. Now what are these foreign exchange reserves? The foreign exchange reserves are the reserve assets held by a central bank in foreign currencies. For example, in India, the RBI is the central bank and it maintains a foreign exchange reserve 
which is composed of foreign currencies. Now India's foreign exchange reserve comprises of the foreign currency assets, for example dollars and pounds. Now this foreign exchange reserve also comprises of the gold reserves, special drawing rights or SDRs which are composed of different currencies and is maintained by IMF. It also comprises of RBI's reserve position in IMF. So the foreign exchange reserves are the reserve assets which are held by central bank in terms of foreign currencies and India's foreign exchange reserve comprises of foreign currency assets for example dollars and pounds, gold reserves, special drawing rights and RBI's reserve position in IMF. Now let us understand what are special drawing rights and RBI's reserve position in IMF. Now special drawing rights is a kind of international currency created by the International Monetary Fund. It involves a basket of national currencies and currently this SDR basket has five currencies. These five currencies are the US dollar, the Euro, renminbi or Yuan which is the Chinese currency, Yen which is the Japanese currency and the fifth one is the British pound. So the SDRs are a basket of national currencies maintained by the IMF and it includes five currencies which are US dollar, Euro, renminbi, Yen and British pound. Now let us understand what is meant by the reserve position of a central bank in IMF. It is also called the reserve tranche in IMF. Now each member country maintains a quota of special drawing rights or designated foreign currencies with IMF. And this quota can be used by that country whenever it is required. Thus the reserve tranche portion of the quota is that portion which is accessible at any time to the member country. So under this article we have learned that the rupee is depreciating and to check this depreciation RBI is intervening in the foreign exchange market. The rupee depreciation is important because it leads to a threat to the macroeconomic stability of the country. This is because India imports 80% of its oil requirement. Further we have learned that rupee depreciation means a decrease in the demand for rupee. This is because there is an increased supply of rupee. And finally an RBI manages this exchange rate of rupee by increasing the sale of foreign exchange that it has. India's foreign exchange reserve comprises of foreign currency assets, gold reserves, special drawing rights and RBI's reserve position in IMF. We have also learned that the special drawing rights comprises of five currencies and finally we have learned that what is meant by the reserve position in IMF or what is meant by the reserve tranche in IMF. Now let us try to solve the questions asked in the previous preliminary examinations. The question asked in 2013 reads which one of the following groups of items is included in India's foreign exchange reserves? Option A reads foreign currency assets, special drawing rights and loans from foreign countries. This option is wrong because loans from foreign countries is not included in foreign exchange reserves. The option B reads foreign currency assets, gold holdings of RBI and SDRs. So as we have learned this option is correct. The 2016 question reads Recently, which one of the following currencies has been proposed to be added to the basket of IMF's SDR market? We have learned about the five currencies which constitute the special drawing rights and the correct answer is renminbi that is yuan which is the Chinese currency. With this, let us move on to the next article. There is an article on page number 6 which reads the RERA report card. It further reads an year after the real estate legislation came into effect, the follow up in many states has been dismal. RERA here refers to the Real Estate Regulatory Authority. Now this topic will form a part of under the General Studies Paper 2 syllabus. It will fall in the subtopic Statutory and Regulatory Bodies. Now this article talks about the shortcomings encountered so far in the implementation of the Real Estate Regulations and Development Act 2016 exactly one year after it came into effect on 1st May 2017. So we will first go through the important aspects of the RERA Act and then we will analyze its shortcomings as mentioned in this article. Now first let us look at the purpose of this act. The purpose of this act is that it aims at establishing the real estate regulatory authority that is the RERA for regulation and promotion of real estate sector to ensure the sale of plot, apartment of building or sale of real estate projects in an efficient and transparent manner. It further aims to protect the interest of consumers in the real estate sector. It also aims to establish the appellate tribunal to hear appeals from the decisions directions or orders of the real estate regulatory authority and the adjudicating officer. So the basic purpose of this act is to regulate and bring about transparency in the real estate market. Now let us have a look at the key provisions of this act. According to RERA, each state and union territory will have its own regulator and set of rules 
to govern the functioning of regulator second the government of two or more states or union territories may if it deems fit establish one single authority so simply two or more states can have a single authority to regulate the real estate market thirdly the government may if it deems fit establish more than one authority in a state or union territory fourth every promoter or builder or real estate agent shall make an application to the authority for the registration of the real estate project before advertising marketing booking selling or inviting persons to purchase any part of the property so the act makes it compulsory for the real estate agent or the builder to register the project with the authority even before the project has started or even before the advertising or the marketing has started the next provision says that it shall be the responsibility of each state regulator to register real estate projects and real estate agents operating in the state under the rera act the details of all registered projects will be put on a website for public access so the act also binds the real estate regulatory authority to register the projects and publish them on the website the sixth provision reads the promoter of a real estate development firm has to maintain a separate escrow account for each of their projects where minimum 70% of the money from the investors and buyers have to be deposited this ensures that money given to home buyers are not misutilized or channelized for some other projects so this provision of the act aims at for checking the malpractices that are prevalent in the real estate market and finally if the promoter defaults on the delivery within the agreed deadline they will be required to return the entire money invested by the buyers along with the pre agreed interest rate mentioned in the contract based on the model contract given by the rera so the key provisions of this act are that each state will form a real estate regulatory authority further every promoter or builder will register the real estate project with the rera authority and this rera authority will register all the projects and put it on website for public access further the promoter of the real estate development firm will maintain a separate escrow account so that the funds are not misutilized or channelized for some other projects and in case of defaults on delivery the promoter or the builder will have to return the entire money along with the pre agreed interest rate mentioned in the contract based on the model contract given by the rera now let us look at the shortcomings in the implementation of the rera act as mentioned in the article the article says that so far only 20 states have framed rules under rera for the registration of builders or promoters some states like uttar pradesh have diluted the provisions under its state rules to benefit the builders for ongoing projects in such cases the state has done away with the requirement of prior registration now even the states which have framed rules under the rera they have diluted the provisions regarding penalty for non compliance the article further says only 6 states have set up the online portal as per the act now the implementation of rera in northeastern states is facing challenge based on constitutional grounds now this is because most of the areas of northeastern states come under the 5th and the 6th schedule of the constitution now under 5th and 6th schedule areas some land belongs to the community and some belongs to the autonomous councils so due to these special provisions it is difficult to implementation rera act now the author says that there is a conflict between rera and the insolvency and bankruptcy code he further explains that recently the insolvency law committee has proposed to treat home buyers as unsecured financial creditors however this provision is against the spirit of the rera act this is because this may increase the delay of returning of money to the home buyers by the promoters because as per the insolvency and bankruptcy code it will become mandatory for the builder to return the money first to the secured financial creditors and then to the unsecured financial creditors and in this case the consumer will be at loss so while explaining the shortcomings in the implementation of the rera act the author says that only 20 states have framed the rules some states like uttar pradesh have diluted the provisions some have done away with the penalty for non compliance six states have not set up the online portal there are constitutional challenges in the implementation of the rera act in the northeastern states further the provisions of rera act have come into conflict with the insolvency and the bankruptcy code the author further says that there has been some sort of course correction by the government in its latest order as per a recent notification by the central government by june 30th 2018 the states have to fulfill the following provisions first formation of permanent regulators in every state second all states have to do away with any dilution in their state laws third bring all incomplete projects within the purview of rera and finally the websites of all states must become functional 
So under this article, we have learned about the purpose of the RERA Act. We have also learned about the key provisions of this Act. Further, we have learned about the shortcomings in the implementation of the Act as mentioned in the article. Also, we have learned about the steps taken by the central government to improve the implementation of this Act. With this, let us move on to the next article. There is an article on page number 6 which reads, Tipping Point in West Asia. The article highlights several conflicts that are going on in the countries in West Asia. The article further says that, in the fight against ISIS in Iraq and Syria, conflicts have started between the allies of United States and Russia. The article further says that, withdrawal of United States from the Iran deal will further destabilize the West Asian region. So we will have a look at the various conflicts that are going on in the West Asian region. Also, we will try to learn the map of the West Asian region because many a times questions have been asked in the preliminary examinations. We will also look at the answers of these questions. The first conflict is between the Iran and Israel in the Golan Heights. Now Golan Heights is a region in Syria. The second conflict in the West Asian region is in Yemen. A civil war has been going on and it has become the theater of action for two regional powers namely Saudi Arabia and Iran on the opposite sides. So in the map, Yemen lies here. A civil war is going on between the The Houthi rebels are supported by Iran and the government of Yemen is supported by Saudi Arabia. The third conflict is the Kurdish referendum in Iraq. Now this conflict has further increased the conflict in the region. Now the Kurds are a group of people demanding independence in the West Asia. They claim that certain areas of four countries that is Turkey, Syria, Iraq and Iran form a part of the Greater Kurdistan. So the countries that are included in Kurdistan and the Kurd people who are demanding independence are in the following four countries. They are Turkey, Iraq, Iran and Syria. So we have learned that there is conflict between Iran and Israel in the Golan Heights which is in Syria. There is a civil war in Yemen where the power play is between the Saudi Arabia and Iran on the opposite sides. So the Kurdistan region involves Turkey, Iraq, Iran and Syria. So the author further says that the recent withdrawal of United States of America from Iran nuclear deal and its threat of sanction have aggravated the conflict in the region. Now the author further says that on the sanctions from the US, the supreme leader of Iran, Ayatollah Khomeini expects E3 countries and Russia and China to raise the issue in UN Security Council for ensuring, for ensuring economic guarantees. So for us, the E3 countries are important. These E3 countries are UK, France and Germany. That is, these countries are part of the European Union. And throwing light on the details of the Iran nuclear deal, the author says that the US list of demands including permanent end to uranium enrichment, missile proliferation, unfettered access to the inspectors, and ending support to Hezbollah, Hamas, Houthi rebels, Shia militias, and Taliban, and withdrawal of Iran from Syria has come as a final ultimatum and has left no scope for diplomatic negotiations between US and Iran. So the author says that these demands have led to a deadlock and has left no scope for diplomatic negotiations between US and Iran. And finally, the author concludes by saying that despite the adamant demands of United States, the Iran can still maintain good relations with other countries as long as Iran complies with the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. He says that if Iran complies with the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, it allows UK, France, Germany, Russia and China to continue support to Iran. Also. Iran's compliance to JCPOA will not allow continued opposition from Israel and Saudi Arabia to gain traction. Thus, despite strict conditions by United States, Iran can still maintain good relations with other countries if it complies with the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. So, now, from the prelims point of view, the geography of West Asian region becomes more important. In the year 2015, a question was asked, the area known as Golan Heights sometimes appears in the news in the context of the events related to. The correct answer to this question was Middle East because the Western Asia is also called Middle East. And from the map we can see that the Golan Heights lies in Syria. Another question was asked in 2015 which reads which one of the following countries of Southwest Asia does not open out to the Mediterranean Sea. As we can see in the map this is the Mediterranean Sea. First option is Syria. So Syria opens in the Mediterranean Sea. So this option is wrong. Second, Jordan. Jordan does not open in the Mediterranean Sea. So this is the correct option. The other two countries, the Lebanon and Israel, both open into the Mediterranean Sea. So the correct answer is B. Again, a question based on the geography of Western Asia was asked in 2017. The question read, 
Mediterranean Sea is the border of which of the following countries? So as we can see in the map, the Jordan does not share its border with the Mediterranean Sea. Iraq also does not share its border with the Mediterranean Sea. So the correct option are Lebanon and Syria, that is 3 and 4. So the correct answer to this question is C, 3 and 4, Lebanon and Syria. With this, let us move on to the next article. Now there is this article on page number 9, which reads, Many ifs around Tista water sharing talks. Now there is a dispute about water sharing of Tista river between India and Bangladesh. Now without getting into the details of this dispute, we will learn about the course of the Tista river. Now this topic will fall under the preliminary examination syllabus under the topic current events of national and international importance. Also under the topic Indian and world geography. Previously in the year 2017, a question was asked based on the course of the Tista river. Now let us have a look at some of the important geographical features of the river Tista. Tista originates in the Pahunri Glacier. This glacier is located on the border of Sikkim, India and Tibet. Tista river passes through Sikkim, West Bengal and Bangladesh. Tista is a tributary of the river Brahmaputra. It forms boundary between Sikkim and the Darjeeling. The main tributary of Tista is the river Rangit. It lies in Sikkim. So the key points about Tista river are that it originates in the Pahunri Glacier located on the border of Sikkim, India and Tibet. It passes through Sikkim, West Bengal and Bangladesh. Tista is a tributary of Brahmaputra river, thus it does not directly drain into the Bay of Bengal. It forms border between Sikkim and Darjeeling and the main tributary of Tista is the Rangit river in Sikkim. Now the question asked in prelims in 2017 read, with reference to river Tista, consider the following statements. The first statement is, the source of river Tista is the same as that of Brahmaputra, but it flows through Sikkim. Now this statement is wrong because Tista originates from the Pahunri glacier while the Brahmaputra originates from the Angsi glacier. The second option reads, the river Rangit originates in Sikkim and it is a tributary of river Tista. This statement is correct. The third statement is, the river Tista flows into Bay of Bengal on the border of India and Bangladesh. The river Tista is a tributary of Brahmaputra and does not directly drain into the Bay of Bengal. Also, it does not form the border between India and Bangladesh. So this option is also incorrect. So the correct answer is B, only 2. With this, we have come to the end of today's discussion. Now let us move on to the question for the day.